Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. All right. Welcome Hi. to the Agile Professionals Meetup. A um, little bit about REI Systems. We are federal contractor, uh, mostly working in the federal space. We do high-end software systems focused mostly on grants management and open government transparency solutions. We have lots of very exciting work in this field and we are hiring a lot this year. Uh, take a look at our website. If you see anything that's interesting to you, uh, please let me know and apply and we'll, we'll get you an interview. And we're very much interested in pushing the boundaries in, in terms of, welcome, in terms of agility in government and helping government um, boost their agility as far as their, their business agility of what they do. So we need folks that are definitely of this mind. So check, out, check, check us out. Today, we have someone that I've known for a long time. Uh, I met him at, at the Agile Alliance Conference in Orlando in 2017, and we hit it off right away. Uh, he's uh, actually a professional coach. He comes from the coaching background. His approach to agility is very human-centered, as I would, I would describe it. And uh, I very much uh, really enjoyed every time he comes and speaks and teaches and facilitates and really has this really self-guided approach that I really admire. And today he's here to talk about, uh, well, to run his little mini workshop on Leading in Complexity, which is a course that he uh, is going to be teaching along with um, Kevin Callahan. That's correct, yeah. Kevin Callahan next month here at REI Systems. And I'll let him talk a little bit more about it if, if that's, uh, but if it's something you're interested in, Leading in Complexity is very much a hot topic these days. It's something that everyone's trying to figure out how to navigate in this new, new b volatile business landscape. It's, uh, Lot, an area where people are seeking tools and techniques and approaches. So I definitely encourage you all to take a look at it. And that is all I have for today. Ne next month we will actually have another meetup at the, I think it's the last Tuesday of the month. I will, I will get it up in the next week. It will be David actually here. He's, uh, He's going to be presenting his session that he will actually be presenting at Agile 2019 in Washington, D.C. this year, in August. So check that out. If you have any questions, just let me know. And now I present you with William. Okay, do we need to hop this over to the other yes. slide? Sorry, just some technical things before we get rolling here. Nice, thank you. Um, so leading in complexity, or like one of my friends said, just leading. Or <laughs> um, kind of what it evolves to, everything is getting to be complex these yeah. days. Uh, so let's see, what do we have? Okay, check-ins for this evening. Uh, this is one of my favorite things of the evening. Uh, so I want you to introduce yourselves to the other people in the room. I want you to do it in the following manner. I want you to get up, move around, find a person and ask them, what is your dream? They can answer whatever they want, it's their dream. Of course, when you get to ask the question from the other person, you can steal their dream, you can import some of it. <laughs> your dream can change, you don't have to have the same dream the whole evening. Is everybody okay with doing that? Yeah, you have to be agile with your dreams as well, right? <laughs> Precisely, yeah. yeah. Some people have got one, some people just have got a thousand. Just on just one dream. Yeah, precisely. So, I'm going to give you five minutes to get up and meet everybody in the room uh, by asking them what's their dream. So, let's go. Fencing. Yeah, so 
That's his background, that's where he comes from. He likes to do downhill racing. Let me see, I wanna I think I can put off the front lights and then it might project a little better. Let's give that a try. Okay, cool. Um, so he likes doing sorry. 
uh, downhill mountain biking. He doesn't like going up hills. He likes going down hills really <laughs> fast. Uh, we coached together for about two years. That's where we hatched a lot of the things we do together. We both IC Agile trained, um, authorized trainers. Uh, and we have both done Agile Uprising podcasts, things like that, just spreading some, some knowledge around. Really great guy. Uh, we're both going to be at the Scrum, the Global Scrum Gathering in Austin next week. So if you're going to be there, come and say hi and meet him. This is me. I'm a little slower. I uh, will take the hiking route where he will take the biking route. Um, I'm the ACC stands for uh, Associate Certified Coach from the uh, ICF, the International Coaching Federation. So I'm a professional coach and I work in the Agile space. I was a mainframe developer way back when. Yes, I used to be able to do COBOL, but it's off my resume now for some reason. I don't know why. Um, but these days, uh, I'm just more doing work in the Agile space, but definitely from a coaching stance. Okay, but enough about us. Let's get back to activities, my favorite thing. Okay, so uh, we need to define what's complexity. So I've got an activity around that. And for that, I will invite you to come and let's use the inside of the U, uh, this space over here. And I'm gonna ask you to line up by height. Yes, they are like so. It's my height, not my height. Okay. So, so I'm going to be in the front, I guess. Go go over there. Uh, we can talk? Yeah, I'm just going to stand at the end. I'm yeah, gonna, I am in this one. I'm actually experimenting with that. Not as short as I am. All right, then. I already Where should I go? Yeah, that's the difference. That's all the guys over there. All the guys over here. Taller over there. I don't have a, a short guy. <laughs> you can be on the left. <laughs> Push on. <laughs> I, as all I think good leaders, right, I just go on here, command, and then I disappear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. There you go. Yeah, yeah. I think we're pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. In middle school, I was all the way over there. Okay. Even promotion. You're all comfortable with this? Yeah. Okay. So, how did we do? Yeah, so think, how much of your work is like this that you do every day? Very rare. Uh, very 1%. Percent. 1%, percent, very rare. Yeah, this is one of those easy things to do, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So now I'm going to ask you to line up by birthday and birth month in silence. Birth date and birth month. Yeah, not yet. Can I, can we start? Or? Yeah, no, you can start. you can't That's talk it. though, so how are you supposed are to you, find out? How do you know <laughs> the numbers? <laughs> That's right, I'm down. Yeah, I mean. Not an idea. Yeah. Yeah. You can use whatever you need, whatever is in the room you can use.
You all good? Comfortable where you stand? Okay. So how much of your work is like this? <laughs> yeah. About 5%. A little bit more. Yeah, yeah. And so part of this, there was some analysis that needed to happen. I mean, the challenge here was you had to do it in silence, but you guys still figured that one out. It was still resourceful. Okay. I did like the phone. That was the yeah, first that stuff was, that came out. I really like cool. that one. See, I also learned everything new every time. There's always something new. Um, so we did the lineup by height. We did now by uh, birthday and month. So now what I'm going to ask is you can reset. Uh, you don't need stickies and papers for the next one. So what I want you to do now is, in your head, find two people. Don't let them know. Just find two people in your head and stay at equal distance from them in this space. So we're going to constellate the system. You've got to keep equal space from two people, and they should know. But know you have to be static. No. And they should know. They should not know. Wait, that, that, that should so in your head, find two people fine. and just stay at equal distance from them. Okay, but it doesn't mean you have to be between them, right? No. Okay. Just stay equal distance from them. What if they move? <laughs> then you have to move to keep time. your equal distance. Yeah. <laughs> Two new people, okay. <laughs> right? So since I violated that, I've got, I've got. He didn't give us all the rules. You should have asked questions. You should have asked questions. Two people in my head. I'm not going to tell you who my two people are. Do I need to repeat because I had the same two people? <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. That was your two people. Stay with that. Okay. So it took you guys about. <laughs> it took you two and a half minutes to get to equilibrium. Yeah. Okay. So here's what I'm going to do now is... Um, it's like 70% like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to ask you, may I touch you to move you? Yeah, of course. Okay. So when I do that, whoever is staying with her will obviously move as well. Because what I'm doing now is I'm trying to figure out in the constellation who has got her as the person. Okay. So let's do three steps to the right. Okay. That's okay. Yeah. okay. Cool. Thank you. Uh -huh. yeah, stop right there. Let's see what happens. Cool. Um, so how much of your work is like this? Half a lot. Uh, yeah, if not more. Yeah. Cool. Um, so reset on this one. So thank you for that. Yeah. Good. So uh, and now, cool. Thank you. The last uh, one is this one actually goes. If there's a fire behind me, all of a sudden the screen bursts into flames. What are we gonna do? Yeah, we're all going to run for the door. Okay. And now I'll, I'll talk a little, grab your seats. Um, and so we did four domains here in essence. Uh, we did one line up by height. Then we did a little bit of analysis to get to the uh, by age, uh, day and month. Then we did a, a complex system, which was kind of getting to equilibrium. And the last one is if there's chaos. So in essence, what I explain is the Kinefin decision uh, framework, which most of you are probably familiar with. Is this new to anyone? Ah, cool. Yeah. And so the reason I'm asking yeah. that is then... Sorry, uh, yes. would we be able to get a copy of this presentation? Is it yeah, I'll send it to, uh, to the group. Dave, Matthias. Yes, Dave Snowden? Yeah, Dave, Dave Snowden. Snowden. Yeah. Yeah, I'll gladly share this with you. Yeah. Very good. And so it's pronounced Kinevin. It's a Welsh word which means habitat. Uh, and Dave Snowden came up with this way back when when he worked at IBM. 
Then he went independent, and now I think it's Cognitive Edge is what his company is called. Uh, and they still do a lot of work based on this model. I will quickly talk us through the model, just very high level. How many, he talks about not quadrants, but domains. So how many domains do you notice on, on that <coughs> model there? Okay, so I'm hearing four. Five. 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 Nine. Nearing nine. Okay. So the domains, as, as I know it, is there's this disorder in the middle. Because normally when you get to any new situation, you don't know what's going on. So he's just calling it you in disorder at that point. Then there's simple, complicated, complex, and chaotic. And those are the five domains. Okay. The things that he talks about uh, and how he, so he's talking the ones in like light red or orange is kind of how you go about making decisions in each of the quadrants. And then the other thing that I like that he adds is he talks about what practice or practices should you use. The reason I like to show this to people, are there people here that's uh, got their PMPs? I am one of them. The pen box is full of Best practices. It also lives in this simple domain, which I sometimes point out to people. We should all be looking at good practices or emergent practices. Because the world where software development is actually living are in those two domains. Uh, complicated is something like you can take, say, a Ferrari. We can take it apart and we can put it back together, and there's one way to put it back together so that it will work again. You can put it back together 50 other ways and it probably won't run again. So there's one and only one answer in the complicated domain. Complex is like we talk about a rainforest. There's so many, that's kind of where you guys were keeping equal distance and if I moved one of you, it had a ripple effect. And there's so many moving pieces. I mean, we just did it here with, how many are we, 13 people in the room? Imagine out in the world how many factors there are. So we are starting to live in a world where we can't predict what's happening. So what we do there is we talk about emergent. So whatever you're going to do or what practice you will have is going to be emergent practices. That's also where Agile lives. It lives in that space. Okay? And it's really well at handling complex um, solutions that you're trying to find because you don't know what it is. That's kind of like all of them have got very short feedback cycles because you need to adjust constantly. If you're going to build a bridge or a building, you know what it is. Waterfall or those plan-based ones work really well in the complicated domain because you're going to build that bridge, the, the, you know, the river or whatever you, you're spanning is probably not going to change. There might be an earthquake uh, or something like that, but the probability of that is very low. Okay. Then the bottom one, of course, is chaotic. That's kind of why I was talking about a fire burst out. You're going to act, and then you will sense and respond what to do. Okay. So in the simple domain, you sense, you categorize, you respond. It's like call center. Calls come in, what's going to be the answer? You put it out to the, per the person who's calling you, and you help them very really quickly. Complicated, you sense, analyze, respond. There's normally a couple of options there that you go by. Uh, complex, you've got a probe. You've got to do something and then sense and respond. And chaotic, you act and then sense and respond. Okay, So that's how I define leading in complexity. So I'm talking about that domain most of all. Because we started to live in that world. They talk in the military of VUCA. Volatility, ambiguity, change, uh, and uncertainty. Thank you. Okay. So everybody good with the definition here of what we talked about? Complicated. Yes. On the chaotic, where it says novel, is that meant to indicate it shouldn't happen very often? Yes. So this domain is one where you probably don't want to stay in very long. Like if this bursts into flame, we want to get out of the room call the fire department, and then hopefully they will come and take care of it, and then we can figure out what to do next. But we don't want to live with fire around us all the time. 
Um, they, he's also, this little thing at the bottom is called the cliff of complacency. If you take something that belongs in the complex or complicated domains and you handle it like in the simple domains with best practices, you will fall over the cliff and end up in chaos. I see that like every second day on the front page of CNN or BBC. Okay? Uh, a lot of people are trying to handle these two areas in a simple manner and end up in chaos. Okay? Very well put. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that's I think my, I can go home now. That, that's <laughs> my political story for this evening. Uh, but let's get I to it. I've learned a lot. <laughs> yeah. Great question. Uh, questions. Anything else around this model? Uh, the, the disorder in the middle, how is that different from chaotic? I mean, so you, this is one where you're just not sure yet when you arrive on the scene. Like when firefighters will get here, they're not sure what's happening where. So they've got ways that they go systemically through every room to figure out where is the fire. Some of them might go after the smoke, but others will make sure there isn't something hiding in some other places. So they've got some really systemic things. So for them, they come here and for them it's disorder until they figure out that's where the fire is and they probably handle it in some complex way. Is there ever a time when, uh, you know, individuals say that they're you know, under complicated, but really they're following the chaotic path. Are they then just in a loop of disorder? Probably not explaining it properly, but. Yeah, so you say something that belongs in this domain, but people are handling it in the yeah. chaotic. So chaotic is normally, you, you will get tired in this domain really quickly, really fast, and it's not sustainable. Okay. So you will move out of it. Uh, you will move into one of the other three domains. People normally, and uh, that's why for me, we started to live in these domains. This one is getting to the point where less and less of the world is there, and more and more of the world is there. Yeah. But if you handle it with these two, you, you will probably not go over the cliff. Okay. Of course, even if you take a compli uh, complicated, uh, problem and you handle it in a complex way, you probably will still get there. You might be doing a little overkill by doing it that way, but you can still accomplish it. So, William, I mean, one, one just, I mean, just a thought. See, a lot of times uh, we also uh, tell people to keep it simple, you know, the KISS formula. Yeah. And also a lot of times you know, we also use dumb it down. I mean, if you see a complicated situation, you dumb it down, you simplify it. Uh, but in what you just said was if you try to, and I understand that, I see that perspective, that you know, try to resolve a, a complicated, a complex issue with a simple approach, you may end up being chaotic. So do you see, you know, some kind of a the, well, consistency so there? I mean, there are two different approaches, but you know, how can we consult them? As yeah, you could still in the complex, the main, you can still use something that's like, don't over-engineer it, don't come up with a big design plan if we just need a sliver of it for something we want to deliver, or we want to uh, do a, a proof of concept on something, don't do a big thing. So you are bringing in the principles of, simplest, of, of the simple domain, mm -hmm. but you're not going to do all the best practices, you're just going to do enough in there so you can do a probe sense and respond. And you're probably going to change pretty quickly what you do there, if you know what I mean. So you're doing very thin slices of it. And you will probably change pretty quick. Uh, I'm thinking like Lean Startup falls really well in there with the pivot and persevere. You do something really small to see should I persevere and keep building or keep doing the service or am I going to pivot? But you're using some simple things yeah, while so you're doing it. from MVP and getting, you know, of course, complex and complicated. Yeah. Yeah, really great point. But if all you do is just do every time just the simplest thing, at some point you're going to know who your customers is, mm -hmm. or customers are, I should say. And at that point, it's kind of like now you need to get more robust. You, you know, so you can't keep doing it all the time. Because that's when you're going to fall off the cliff. But many times, practically, isn't complicated domain the most, uh, it's, it's one of the domains where you see most of the people tend to fall under or they gravitate towards complicated as opposed to simple, even though that might be the goal, but th things in real life are not simple. Many times. So. Yeah, this is just my opinion. It's not going to say this is the truth or not, but I'm finding most people's 
conscious level and action logic is for that domain, but we are working with stuff that's in this domain. Mm. And that's where the disconnect comes in. And that's kind of why I'm going, we need leadership development. Of course, we all need to develop ourselves so that our action logic goes up, our conscious level goes up, so that we can work in a complex world. Because the world has moved there, if we want to or not, we need to catch up. Yeah, that's, where I, that's my viewpoint where I'm coming from. Okay. Yeah, and I, I, I would say I kind of relate to what you say because I, I hear a lot of engineers always say you can't simplify it, you can't, uh, be, because I think what they want to avoid is they want to, they see things as complicated and when you say let's simplify it to get a better understanding, they think that you're trying to take them down the sense categorize respond where you're going to say okay, it's a, it's a simple system, let's categorize it and like come up with a simple like process to deal with it, when really what you want is simplify it to get a sense of you know, how to respond. Mm -hmm. what's right. the, yeah, what's the smallest probe we can do? Because right. then you might get to, and that's where emergent comes from then. Of course, out of that you're going to learn really quickly and then you go, Oh, yeah, you might have, we've got a book full of best practices and you're going to go, we're actually writing new pages with really short, small stuff based on the emergent nature. Yeah, but the fear is always, when you apply that simple to the complicated, you get into the, you're, that's like straight path to the chaotic. And so mm -hmm. everyone's always like on guard not to get into that situation, especially when you're an engineer always dealing with complicated systems. Yeah. So, William, that brings me to another point, actually. So, uh, quite a few organizations, you know, they have now playbooks for best practices. And, um, you know, and they urge the teams to just go and, you know, um, get, always consult those, uh, read those playbooks first. And they call them best practices. So, what's your take on that? They, they might be playing in this domain, yeah. It depends on their type of playbook as well. If the playbook allows for things to grow and evolve, then their playbook might fall there. If their playbook is based on a big plan, and this is what you're going to do for the next two to five years, I would advocate that they fall in the domain over here. Yeah, sorry David, I saw your hand up as well. No, no, uh, uh, it was a different thing. Oh, okay. I'm going to get, yeah, okay. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so for me, I, I think playbooks mm -hmm. live over here. Um, when I work in organizations, I see a lot of the McKinsey's, Accenture's, those kind of people come in with their playbooks. And as long as they've got pieces in there that can evolve, I think it's good. If it's not, then it's set, and I'm kind of like, this has to be dynamic and constantly evolving. Yeah, the world is. Yeah. Yeah. And it might be because otherwise they're giving you a solution for this moment. And a day later or a year later the world has changed. And then it's not going to be applicable anymore. That's why I'm saying it. Okay. So just watch out for those. Okay. But enough of me, I don't want to bash those big guys because they've got deeper pockets than me. Um, this brings us into how do we do change? Um, so a little bit about where, where do we come from with our beliefs and things like that. So we've got this pyramid and here's our current thinking where we go, we live our lives and we behave and we do things based on values and beliefs. Okay? Because we all come from various places, it might be uh, from the culture, the country, um, how I grew up, the latest course I took whatever influences you, that will create your values and beliefs. Some people tell they were brought up. You, can, you, you know what I'm getting at here. The next level we're talking about is then, principles will guide those values. Hi David. The next to that is the, so the first two principles and values and beliefs are inside of you. People won't know that unless you say that or it will show in how you behave. So it's not somebody can kind of open your head and read what it is. It's either you're going to tell them what it is or you're going to behave in a certain manner. 
then the next thing that normally happens is some processes get layered on top of that. Especially, especially if the household grows or you join a company that gets bigger. I've been in startups where we had none, and I've been in huge organizations of thousands of people where you do need processes. They're not bad, it's just they, they build on top of these. Then within that, we always put tools in, because tools help you to automate things, make life easier. They will also constrain you at points. And then on top, we've got outcomes and results. Because that's normally why is an organization there, or even a household. How do we live our life? What's our purpose? Those kind of things come out. So here's where change comes in. So where do people normally focus when they want to bring change, especially in the organizational setting? Where do you think change will be? I see a lot of focus on the top of the pyramid. On, <laughs> on the top of the pyramid. On the processes, yeah. Ah, agree with you. Where should it be? We're using this lower. Lower, as lower as Actually, I think outcomes. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say outcomes. So the things at the bottom will do outcomes. And so what we're saying is, if you want to change that, you are correct. But you don't change those, you've got to change either those or those to change those. Does that make sense? Yeah. Articulating it that way. So what we've noticed is a lot of people focus there, and we go, let's focus on the people side. Because uh, once we change the people, it will influence and create new processes and new tools may be needed or not, or they can adapt the tools. But sometimes people only change processes and tools and then they expect these miracle outcomes and it doesn't happen. Okay. So that's kind of why we, we're talking about these. So let's go a little deeper into the values and beliefs here. So shifting values. Uh, there was a bunch of middle-aged white, white guys in 2001 that created this manifesto that everybody's raving about. <laughs> um, you probably know what I'm talking about. And their manifesto is all about effectiveness. Because they were talking about software delivered to the life people. Um, and so we grabbed the four values out of the Agile manifesto for software development. It can also be adjusted because now people are talking more about business agility which means how to be agile in like HR, budgeting, all those other areas as well. So they were talking about these four values and they were saying it's not like the one isn't important, it's just more important than the other. You do need processes and tools, much like the pyramid, you need to have them in place. But they were advocating that individuals and interactions were more important, which lies at the bottom of the pyramid. The same thing with Working software, that can also change to be sales or marketing or HR uh, or people, what is it, people ops. I've heard that term thrown out these days as well. Um, of course, we're not resources, we're people. Um, so I like that change that actually, that's actually happening. Uh, anybody here from HR? <laughs> Just checking. Just not in deep trouble. Um, but what I'm trying to say here is a lot of people, the working software can be changed or adapted and we just don't want handbooks or guidelines or you know things like that they are important but whatever your purpose or deliverable is is more important or service you provide uh, and then they also talk about customer collaboration over contract negotiations so like the people side of it they literally amplifying that uh, and responding to change over following a plan because that's the one when you know like you guys were talking about the playbook if you've got the playbook you're going to be following a plan. And what I'm advocating for is I want to respond to change. I might start off with a playbook, but let's move away from it as needed or when needed or some market force might force us to do that. Okay. So we, the big takeaway here is we talk about when in doubt value in that emergence over telling. Because all these things is a form of telling and all these sides are emerging things coming out. Does that make sense? Okay. So, next up is we, we're talking about some principles. So we're kind of going up the pyramid a little bit here. So we had what was like this kind of a, a values that we laid out. So let's talk about those principles that can inform or enhance the values. So what we're doing here is I was talking about that move from talent to emergence. And these are a lot where 
I'm seeing this happen in organizations. People come in, they bring all these wonderful frameworks in, and the managers and people in leadership positions have got no idea what to do because nobody's talking to them or telling them what to do, except you can't come talk to the teams, go away. And they get frustrated, which I can understand. And so part of what we need to do is we need to help those people and say, we've now moved from the age of we're building, you know, just cars or putting widgets together to knowledge workers. We've moved from that age of Taylorism over to where things is really emerging and changing really fast. And the people doing the work probably know more than the people leading them. Okay. We get to that point. And you can't see the work anymore. In Lean, they talk about you go do game by. You go and walk and you can see the assembly line. How far is that car put together? You can't go to the, to the team and go, hey, how far are you with that software? Because it's going to go, yeah, the whole server's busy running or whatever. They, nobody's going to know what's really going on there. So that part of it is you don't have to have the answers anymore. What you want to have is you can ask them questions. Where are you? What's happening for you? What can we help you with? Okay? So you don't have to. They can come up with it. they resourceful, creative, and they probably have the answers already. They're knowledge workers. The next thing that I'm also advocating for changing is we don't have to enforce accountability. Everybody's into the roles and responsibilities and what are you accountable for? And what can I ask you tomorrow to see if it's done? Versus let me just hold them as responsible. If I give them a vision and they've got the correct motivation, all I need to do is get out of their way. Much like Dan Pink said in his book Drive, mastery, autonomy, and purpose. If you put those things in place, then they, the responsibility will be there, the motivation is in place. Next one is reactive tampering to inform discipline. Where I see a lot of times when uh, the managers will go and, and this is where micromanagement comes in. This is kind of alluding to that term. They want to come and tell every single step that every people need to do. You need to take this widget and put that widget and do this one and do it in this order. And then if they keep doing that, the worker or whoever is doing the work, the person is just going to sit back and wait for the next set of instructions to come. Versus if you just say, we want you to work in this manner, and here's what we want you to do or create for us. Go about doing it what you need. Okay. So once again, we can... Sorry, Liam. Um, yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so in the real world, actually, a lot of times, um, you know, employers actually now require a lot of hand-holding than just asking questions from the coaches, from the scrum masters. You know, they just want to be very, very hands-on. And, um, you know, and we say that there has to be a good balance between your engagement and detachment. You know, just your, you ask questions and get out, of, get out of their way. But what what you say to them, those kind of managers? And because, you know, they just like, well, you know, just want to have solutions right away. Because they're accountable to somebody else out there who doesn't have any idea what's going on in this active world. So, that, this is very complex, you know, coming back to you. Yeah. Of your let, let them go. They, so part of, uh, and that's kind of why we create this two-day course. It's the start of a journey for them, because they need to grow. They literally need to grow. It's, it gets this, well, where we're going with this is uh, developmental coaching, um, personal growth, and they need to learn new styles of leadership. That's what's needed in, in the world today. I see it missing in a lot of organizations, and that's why we created this course. Uh, we do have grander designs and can start with a two-day. There's lots of books to read. That's also why I went into the coaching profession, because that's a way where I can help grow people. Whereas coaches don't fix people. We take them where they're at and we make them better. Or at least the people as professional coaches. Um, a lot of other people call themselves coaches and they come in as consultants. And those are the people that want to give you the answers. And that's not actually... Because that answer is just for that moment where I come in and I say, let's change the way that you behave. Let's go and look at your values and beliefs and then it will change your behaviors. And then I can leave because I know as things change in the world, they will also change and be able to handle it. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah there's a lot of emphasis on the processes rather than behaviors and cultures and mindsets. So, and that's yeah. what they actually ask you to do. Just 
because you know, come fix our processes. Yeah. Not the mindset. Yeah, that's kind of why I had the red box. Yeah. I want to go down to the green box at the bottom. Cool. David, you also. I, I just. Yeah. My two cents. Um, early on on the project, uh, we're, we just wrapped up a year. We we did our big release. Hey, everybody, do a fist bump. Um, and it, I got a lot of feedback from my chain of command above me saying, we want this report, what, are your, what is your team working on? And you know what, give me five, 10 minutes, maybe 15, and I will be able to have that for you. Because I drilled into my team, not what they were supposed to do, but that they had to have good acceptance criteria. And my feedback was, your, fee your acceptance criteria needs to be in a yes, no format, right? And I, I didn't call it informed discipline, but that's essentially what I did, and I, I gave them the bandwidth to meet with the stakeholders. So even though I had the title of product owner, my team is constantly meeting with them, right? The people above me don't know that. What they know is that when they asked, I was able to turn to the team, get the report that I supposedly knew in my brain and had on my computer, got it from the team, they spit something out from Jira because it was all captured there. And I was able to effectively do what they want in their in an integral, spirally sort of thing, they were red. I'm, uh, I imagine I'm teal and my team is teal, but obviously we're not. But the point is, I feel like the informed discipline made us actually better at pretending to be reactive tampering. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. Yeah, and it's part of, uh, so sometimes we don't need to solve problems, we can transcend it. Um, of course, if you try and solve everything, you stay at that level. Um, and I think I put the quote from Einstein in there where, you know, the problem that you can't solve the problem at the same conscious level that created it, you need to level up. Mm -hmm. yeah. The situation that I'm in now um, is very reliant, and I just started two months ago, two, three months ago, but it's very reliant upon reactive tampering where my superiors will say to my team, do it this, this, and this way. It isn't the correct way. So when I step in, they're like, hey, don't worry about it. When I try to provide a little informed discipline, uh, it doesn't work because I'm told that that's the way the culture is. And being, coming from an environment that basically was, because David and I used to work on, on the same project where uh, Scrum Masters were an advocate of culture change, uh, that's a little, rough for me to to work through so I just sort of take a hands-off approach and I'm like okay if you guys want to do it this way that's fine um, knowing sort of my place I prefer to do this one but how would you handle that yeah, because when it comes to telling your superiors hey you're doing reactive tampering is it just more of a scrub master you need to stand up for themselves or what exactly so I think I have a good example for this. Um, you know, the way I see it, it's a, l a lot of times that leadership level has gotten where they are in a world where the left side made sense and they could, they could get them there. But in the complex world, everything's getting more complex. You have to, the real solution that's effective is on the right side. Right. And so what I found, because I, I still have managers that their initial instinct is react, and tamper, change something, and that will do something. And so what I say to them, in that situation, I say, let me survey the team and get, I'll do a poll, and then we'll, we'll tamper based on what the poll says. Okay. And so, whereas first they might say, okay, we gotta tamper, let's change people around. I'll say, let's do a poll on what the team thinks, and then they'll see the results from the poll, and they'll say, oh, okay, Maybe we just need to have the, the team do this on this day and that will be enough, that will solve yeah. it. So that, I, I think when you move towards, a, let's look at some data, let's look at feedback, you get away from the reactive and more towards the informed. Okay. And um, one experience that I want to share uh, that we're talking about, I think having retrospectives yeah. mm -hmm. has also helped where teams can actually come out and say, uh, that there has been reactive tempering which has not been uh, helpful for the teams to grow um, and do their work, right. that has helped. And it has helped management just take a step back and say, okay, 
teams know what they have to do and they are empowered to make their own decisions. Yeah, yeah so there's various ways. There's ones where you can literally be a shield and try yeah. and do them. You can do the one where how do we expose them to that or leverage the team? Or you can go, here's a mirror, I'm noticing you tampering again. Um, of course, awareness precedes choice, which will proceed change. Yeah. So sometimes just tell people, I'm noticing you tampering them again. What's that bringing in? How's it helping you? How's it helping the team? So once again, you're not pointing, you're holding up a mirror and just asking a question and then see where it takes them. For some of them it will work, for some of them it won't. So just say that as well. Yes. So I have a different situation. <coughs> one of my projects, I have four so One of my projects, the whole team is new. Management doesn't want me to tell them how to do, when to do, where to do, and all those instructional side and left side. But they don't know because they're new. They don't know the process. And it's a new software, and it's a uh, uh, third party tool. We're trying to establish and configure and you know, provide the access to the tool. So in this situation, I mean, I know the whole thing because <laughs> I've been working on those for a long time. Management doesn't want me to leave them. They said, no, no, just, just be the agile <laughs> scrum master on that project and then let them figure it out. We heard their line. It's a paid, prepaid, I um, mean, funded by government and you cannot just let, let it sleep just like that. It's sleep many times. So in this situation, it's kind of complex. I'm still trying to figure it out how to I tell them that yes, they need some guidance. You cannot simply let them play with it because they are still learning. They just started recently. They need to get used to the you know, norms and the processes and everything. And they, as a third party tool, they don't know that. So, yeah. it, it's so have you asked them, do you want my help? I did. And what did they say? Yes. <laughs> so then you weren't right. So, so at that point, you weren't just going in and telling them. So the whole thing is, you did come from this side where you asked them, do yes, you want my help? And then if they invite you, obviously then do it. Because now you've got information they don't. So they're not knowledge workers yet. But you can elevate them to that point. So there's ones where we don't follow it blindly. We go with, what's the situation? What's the context? And what makes sense? But it's not like you walked in saying, you're the new guys, I know everything, sit down, let me tell you. If you go, here's the thing, do you want my help? Because now from both sides, you were willing to give the information, they were willing to receive it. Now, if the management don't get that, I would just you know, go, don't worry about it, we're working, we're working this out. <laughs> yeah, that's another problem. Management just wants not to handhold. At the same time, they want to get, job, get the job done. Yeah. So it's kind of a very tricky situation. Of course, try to help them. Sometimes I help them without yeah. informing. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm hearing there's also a, we talk about edge behavior. So there's one way at some point you need to know when can I let go enough so they can start doing it on their own and learning from their own mistakes. That's yeah. the quickest way to get there. But that's costly too sometimes. Yeah. Agree. So mistakes. Can I, can I comment on Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, so basically, so you have, if you have a team, if they don't know the scrum processes, the event ceremonies and rules and responsibilities, yes, as a scrum master or coach, you have to teach them, right? For example, if your sprint is three weeks, you have to tell them, yes, you have to respect this uh, duration, this term. So what's, why would the management have a problem with that? No, they have no problem with the scrum side. They have more of this knowledge. You talk about the technical, technical side. Yeah, this is, it sounds like a Scotch product. Implementation, yeah. <coughs> that, that is more. Process is fine. They don't care. They really don't care about the um, you know, team. Doesn't care about the process. A lot of times, Scrum Masters aren't supposed to actually help with the technical stuff. You know, you're just a mm, process. Yeah, but it, it's a hybrid situation. So since my That's background is so friendly here, so I'm still talking about from the Scrum Master perspective. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. And so just to highlight, you, you can also lead from wherever you are. You can be a team member, you can be a product owner, you can be a CEO, um, you can be a director or a vice president of whatever. You lead from wherever you are. Um, that's also another thing that comes into play. So all of these are applicable to all of those levels, to be honest. 
So instead of solving all your individual things, and is it okay if we keep going here? Because I do have an exercise at the end, otherwise we're going to run out of time. Um, the next thing is we're also talking about managing resources versus leading people. That's the old adage where, and they talked about resources because it's just like a machine that you put together, which is in the comp uh, complicated domain. And people are more evolutionary, and that's in the complex domain. So that's kind of why you lead people. You don't want to go and manage the resources to every step. Uh, the other one is being certain versus understanding the arts. In the complex domain, you're not going to know what's going to happen next. Be it tomorrow, next week, or next month. You're not always sure. The world is getting way more uncertain. So what you want to do is, I'm not going to lay out a two-year plan or a five-year plan because I know two or three months from now it's going to be updated in any case. Mm. So what do I do? I start looking at the odds or what am I certain of or what can I do to minimize the risk? Or if something is risky, let's tackle that first. Okay. So just different things and it will impact how you prioritize whatever you do. So that's where you start working on understanding your arts. Then next is developing talent and versus influencing systems. So a lot of times they go, oh, we've got these you know, set courses that, or classes that everybody's got to take. We develop the talent, you know, and that stuff is probably outdated to start with or not really cutting edge. Where we're going, if you're influencing systems, much like we were moving around on the floor here, if you put people together that's got capabilities, this person is really good with, say, Angular, and this person is really good with being DBA, and that person is really good with UX, you can leverage them. You put them together in a team, and that team will then, and that's kind of what we talk about systems. And so now we even talk about organizations, different departments. Sometimes you've got to break down silos. You will literally have to reorganize an organization start working at more the upper echelons. And it's scary for some people because uh, there's uncertainty. Then the next one is giving direction versus, versus fostering narratives. So a lot of times here yeah, is we talk about that's our vision and that's where we want to go. But there's also sometimes you need to talk about what is the vision or what does it mean. So that's why we talk about fostering narratives and also bring their vision in and how it aligns to what you're doing. Uh, and it can be, I mean, a lot of the government agencies here have got excellent missions. If I look at their missions and visions, they're protecting the country. You know, the census have got to count everybody in the country every 10 years because there's a lot of other economical things that happen on that, especially on the social side. What, what's getting funded, where does all the money go? So they've all got really great missions, even if I just think of those things, but it's not unlocked because it's all in one way. It's not a narrative, it's a monologue. And so that's kind of why we say fostering narratives is way better. And you do it in small, almost bubbles or areas, but you can do that, okay? So this is what we mean by shifting principles and how to move it from telling to emergent, what will come up. Because if you've got a two-way conversation, somebody else that somebody perceives as, oh, they're just new to the organization or they you know, fresh out of college, sometimes the brightest ideas are there. So, now we're going to make it your turn to take this pyramid of ours further. So let me see. I have got some handouts. Oh, and a couple of pens. Hopefully I'm not going to lose them all. You've got some extra pens. Give you a couple. I'll give you a couple. And I will give you some more instructions now. Grab one and pass on. Grab one and pass on. Did somebody bring their own paint? Yes. Ah, good. Because I think I I don't have enough. But we can always check. Um so this is actually designed to work in we talk about you'll see now in the instructions, I talk about workstations. So this is not just for software development. We can talk here if we want to. Anyone else need a pen? Everybody good with a writing instrument? Okay. Um, so you'll see here, yeah, we want you to get into small groups. You can self-organize into how many you want. 
we also, instead of like, I was supposed to put up workstations. So yeah, stuff that's gonna be like finance, HR, IT, um, yeah, whatever you wanna call, whatever part of your organization you wanna work on. Or you guys can all decide we're all gonna work on IT. That's fine by me as well. You can do it in each of your groups. What I want you to do is, I want you to fill in the model. Do we still have extras? So the values and the principles, I, I kind of gave you. The values is the, the agile values. The principles I'll bring up in a second again. Those are the ones I said shift from the left to the right, shift from talent to emergent. And I want you to then look at the rest of them. And somebody already actually said it doesn't mean you have to work from the bottom up. You can also work from the top down, okay? Depending on if you're more results orientated. And then see what do you want to change? Be it at your organization or a fictitious one, based on what area you want to tackle. Be it IT, HR, budgeting, all those areas. Okay? So depending on how big you might make your group. If there's five people, you might want to say, who's the scribe, who's the timekeeper, and who's the facilitator? Because I'm going to give you five minutes to just get in a group and brainstorm what area do you want to work on. And then I'm going to give you 20 minutes to complete the changes that you want to do. So, and, so, and think of it as what's likely to help and what's likely to hinder on these things of the principles and then how will that influence your processes and what tools you'll use for the new outcomes clear as mud yeah, as mud as mud okay <laughs> questions okay so self-organize into as many groups as you want you can be pairs trios groups of five however you want Okay, a big of the main. Tell me what the main you're working at. We have IT ops. Is there anybody that has cloud or DevOps types of work? Sure. IT DevOps or IT cloud or anything that's going to rapid change and complexity. It's going to be a I just throw it out of the box. Sorry. I think we have to say what we're talking about there. We're all just okay. giving direction versus fostering narratives. Yeah, me too. Uh, that was my uh, my top choice. I guess. Yeah. 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 Um, how would your client work? How would you apply oh, your yeah. Moving the yeah. directions. Right. Um, yeah. It's probably going to be how I would do so within a small. Within a small. So we said that we were maybe we're building a custom C rapidly. Like start with keep that. Yeah. How does he give on this one? What does it tell us about applying this in the organization? Yeah, I think probably at the heart of it is going from like um, one sided one sided direction or one sided monologue to, to one or one or one or dialogue or getting you want. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. So what I'm advocating for say you get a so something it's about you know, ID. Okay. I think that's and then you can say yeah. what yeah. levels, what so behaviors do we want to what kind of issues with that is definitely, you know, in the white way in the process. It's more about exploration. And saying, you know, what constantly soliciting what's the story here? Can you tell me what is the, story, the narrative that you're forming here? Instead of me saying, okay. But you know, have to focus on it. here's a DOS prompt. Here's, you know, here's a batch file that you have to create. You know, okay. So, uh, hey, you remember in Tinkerbell and Lost Treasure when Tinkerbell and Lost Treasure 
work and then she ended up breaking the, the receptor that she was supposed to maybe be fixing. She made it worse. Okay. She lost her temper. Oh. Why did you come to the and then we had a conversation with working from the store. Yes, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. And then we were in terms of the I think whichever works for you. Yeah, I think the other one is going to take you to that work. I'm seeing like, like, it's not that you have to eschew giving direction. Like, it's good, that's a good starting point. Like, the intention is to give direction. But the effective way to deal with that in the complex world is by moving to fostering in there. Because you want to teach, you want to teach your child about, you know, a, a lesson. You want to give her the direction, right? But instead of, because she lives in a complex world, yeah, yeah. you don't want to just what say, you want to you know, when you, you, get, you, get, you, get, you throw a temper tantrum, this is what's going to happen, right? You want, her, you want her to form a narrative around her because that, that's how you connect it to like her behavior and that's how you change, right? Yeah. So, what will be the behaviors? I don't want to see my behaviors. Step back and be a resource in the future. So if they need something, well, you can provide them from front of the same Yeah, problem. yeah. How do you, you respect yeah. them? Yeah. Encourage them, them and just help them hold them and that's one of those things. All the values are strong. Yeah. Yeah. So this day, you want to see the leadership of the house and you want to be able to exact values and you leave the house and you want to work. 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 Think around the time yeah. you know, yeah. trust him that uh, within micro oh, now really yeah. Yeah. So he has to way to go and get himself ready it's enough. always this way wow that's so what I think we how are old where this potential culture wow we're processing um, so, so, yes. so I mean, our the first thing when it's in the same way around we are what you have been this is how it's and you know let's practice it now Today. Because yeah. you're yeah. 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 yeah, you are very successful. The part of the go and the process. I was right there. My wife was also out from this and come up with a lot of people. Because we told you to do building up the customs and the fact that you were there enforcing a comment that was still about this dependent interference. We are here and want to forget. Okay. Okay. Great. So how how they just sat back there and just watched him do this? The 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 remember yesterday when you did this? Because that we did it all yourself. I didn't tell you when to go. So it would be enforcing. Me laying down the challenge the previous night. They want to just do whatever they want to do. Meant it was more so like, like that. Uh, 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 enforcing accountability, not, not, not to give direct all the time. Yes, the end of the process. Right? And then current uh, responsibility would be? Anyway, I, I, help. I think there's. What would uh, uh, I'm wondering if like they're into that. If they just wanted to measure hours. Yeah. What is the outcomes of the moving to outcomes and results? In terms of processes. It can be. In terms of the, 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 the behavior, you already got like servant leadership versus micro telling stories in advance. They wanted to measure how many hours people were and then the behavior yeah. was. Yeah. As yeah. As so when you are it's not going to be a that I know that I don't from it. Give answers, I ask questions. You're telling me what you're doing. So it could be a principle letting him be in the principle in that space. Make his own learning. Could, could be a 
is a process, though, because you're, it is a process that you go through. That is our organization of getting this bus. So our story was kind of a structure for the process that you should follow. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, okay, being know. certain that is also yeah. being known, yeah. you're taking things for granted for breakfast. Yeah, so it should be on, be ready to go that is just all done. Yeah. 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 So that's a very process-oriented thing. So tools, like you know, and I'm sitting down there and watching the tools, creating some kind of rapid we can classify it as a process for the thing. It could also be behavior. I have to let him through that. Yeah, I have to let him know how this goes. Values and beliefs are the processes. Articulating a specific set of some expectations here. But, you know, I'm going to say, I see where this goes. So then, so then, so let's get it give it a try process. Right. Okay, so there's no so like yeah. yeah. The opposite would be the specialized yeah. 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 We get dressed at about the same yeah. time. Yeah. I got my pants on, you And then uh, every now and then, I'm I think she's not with the And I say, you're getting distracted. Right. And then every now and then she comes to my office and she's like, you're getting distracted. I'm putting on the shirt. But she likes yeah. Right. And so, it's right. so developing. Right. So, I got a constant like this tick of am I being distracted? Because if I don't keep aware of the tick, uh, yeah, the yeah. distracted tick, I definitely want to call Daddy out on it. Right. Right. I have, yeah, when so I go to Daddy's office, I better have my shirt on. Now we're back here. What is that? What what realm is that in? Which makes those require specialized expertise. I, I guess it's a little bit of an informed discipline that's a principle. So to be a instead of telling her it's not distracting, it's now gone from reactive tampering and telling her it's distracting to Yeah, you're right. It's still developing. But it's developing into an informed discipline which is think about being distracted. Developing this is our Right. But it's kind of like, it's like a technique. It works. It, it keeps you aware of this, you know, your distraction and lets you redirect your attention. So, yeah, as opposed to measuring flow. Yeah, it's kind of like a behavior, but there's a principle behind it. Yeah. yeah, maybe you should pick another one. It's a, yeah. a process. Um, That's your recipe. I like to do X and Y and Z. Right. And the behavior is. Can we go to the side? No. Oh, no, 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 yeah, that's right. So by some situation here that I was, I gave them a list of things to do, but that boiled down to a generalized behavior and a generalized behavior. You know, I always, you know, take care of the essential before it takes care of the So, so the option. I'm going to bring it to work for a moment. So, maybe, maybe. So, <laughs> the we have display of view, right? But the behavior is we regularly using that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Only yeah. 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 small yeah. units yeah. and proof that they really work. Yeah, yeah. like uh, not just to ourselves. Yeah. 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 The process yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. A retrospective. The behavior is reflection. 
So it's more, I mean, the, the general pattern, I think, is as you keep going down, when it comes to, like, geek data, it's kind of like, make, it's about curiosity, right? And, Fostering curiosity. Ignorance is and leading with curiosity. And that will get us the outcomes of and then the principal will be asking I think among teams that's like the help yeah processes but I feel like each one I would probably say the value is whatever you're geeky passionate about being geeky and passionate about something that's the value yeah. that's a good right? point yeah the principle is curiosity right right right, right. Yeah. Hmm. I heard from a colleague at Capital One. Well, I published a test of drug description. So. Wait. Yeah. Because, well, because, um, well, the way I see it is that, you know, if, you're, if the value is. Geekiness and really being passionate right, into don't, something. Don't, um, then if you have the principle of, well, lead with curiosity, that will lead you to, you know, that, will, that will kind of be the pathway of leading to action. It, it, it takes the value and turns it into action. If the value is in the discussion, I've liked the discussion. So it's kind of like you move upward, right? You start here, so you keep curiosity, um, you know, behaviors, of, you know, trying things out to how you make the bus. Which leads to processes which something emerges where he'll 
he will do reading or something. He'll come up with a process that over time will become his process. Then he might, you know, he's got his reading book, he's got his tools, he's got an alarm clock possibly that might come in the picture. And then outcome, you'll consistently on your own catch the bus. So the two behaviors Okay. Who got the whole pyramid filled out? Mostly. So I just want to say that wasn't actually the aim of the exercise. It was literally to talk about all the stuff and have a construct. Okay. Who got some great insights or ahas they want to share? So, so um, through the discussion, I, I realized that a lot of these things down the chain are the answer to why from the thing above. Or, yeah, you know, yeah. as you go down, why, how, why do we use this tool? The process is the answer to the tool and, and so forth. And the process is built on a principle. It's built on a, beha well, a behavior, built on a principle based on a value. That's yeah. Really <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Thank you for sharing. Yes. So uh, one thing, in part of, as a part of discussion, we figured out as far as the behaviors are concerned, uh, the servant leadership model really helps. Uh, and that's mapping back to the you know agile principle and value. Uh, so that will, is going to likely to help uh, versus micromanagement when that would end up. Yeah, that's a great observation because a lot of, um, when you look at the lower leadership styles are the ones that aren't really effective, are very much egocentric. And as soon as you change to become a servant leader, you don't put yourself in the front or in the center of whatever is happening. So just by doing that, you're already leveling up your leadership style. And then there's fine nuances and going higher with different leadership styles. But yeah, that was great. Cool. Other insights? Things you want to share? Well, we, we kind of wanted to talk about um the enforcing accountability versus encouraging responsibility, but how does ownership play into those two things? Because I always feel like you go to meetings, you talk about stuff, everybody has great ideas, and everybody leaves the room, and nobody owns it, it just sort of gets dropped. And so it's, it's not exactly accountability, it's not exactly responsibility, so how do you feel about that? Uh I've got a little exercise around that. Do you want to play that with me? It's going to take you two minutes. Sure. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, think of two things on your to-do list and write down, I have to, and then whatever it is. Just for two things. So one of them, I'm just making my own up, I'm just saying it out loud, might, might be, I have to take out the garbage and I have to pay taxes, okay? Now write down, I choose to, and then whatever you said you have to do. So I choose to, in my case, I choose to take out the garbage and I choose to pay taxes. Was there any difference in feeling from the first to the second? Shifted responsibility. Yeah. 
So that's where responsibility kicks in, is when you choose to do something, when you have to do it, it's accountability. And just that's, it's exactly the same thing, but it's a subtle nuance, and that's where the shift comes in. So how do you, so how do you get that volunteer? <laughs> you when, when you have to do something, that's accountability. Where somebody is holding you accountable, you have to do that. Where responsibility is you choose to do that. Okay. Yeah, and I, I get that. I just still don't really get where, you know, that the whole idea of somebody who, to me, an owner is not necessarily somebody who has to do it. But it's somebody who has to remind somebody to do it, or something similar, or maybe they are doing it. Yeah, like I, we just talked about the, when you go to a meeting and you talk about certain things, and a lot of times it's, it's a technical discussion. Like this is, you know, five different things that people are talking about, and maybe the, you know, maybe it's a lot of disjointed complicated integrated system stuff and you leave that meeting and you're still not sure well oh okay who's who's doing that or and, and it's usually not so much the leadership people it's the actual team members who are then put in that compromising situation of they themselves don't really know who's doing that and so therefore there's this whole communication gap and so how do you get that implemented so that your team can kind of understand that okay to me that's just the best practice I mean <laughs> best practice but yeah and so a lot of the frameworks have got those things built into it like in scrum for every sprint you want to sprint goal so people align whatever their work is is this contributing to help us reach the goal if not why are we doing it uh, Kanban is how quickly are we going to move this card to to the to, to to meet the definition of that, all those things. So that's kind of how we unlock responsibility, and we don't tell them how to do it. We empower them to do it. We give the autonomy to them uh, to do that. So it's kind of like you want to unlock that intrinsic motivation, and it's a mind shift. Just like writing those two sentences feels different. It's also it becomes a new way of thinking, which is a behavioral thing. So you want to change a principle that will affect that behavior, which will then go through the processes and tools to the results. Okay. Cool. Anything else you guys want to share? Um, we had similar to what Raj had said in terms of, um, you know, the micromanaging, having autonomy with the teams so that uh, they take on you know, feel responsibility and accountability yeah. for the work and not not the micromanaging which hinders, you know, all of those activities. So. Yeah. A lot of this is what I talk about creating and holding space for that to happen and emerge. Um, agility is an emerging phenomenon. It's not something you instill or, or I go I now bless you, you agile. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> if you create the space, you do some education around it, and then you've got to put motivation in place, and then you've got to hold the space for that to emerge. And then you've got to figure out what do I need to tweak for that to happen. It's not there. Yeah, for me it was, there was a moment where it was kind of, the epiphany was get over the panic that you feel when there's no answers. When you say to the team, you know, this we have this problem, or so, we need someone to own this, and just wait and hold the space until they come. Someone comes in and says, "You know what? I'm sick of the silence. I'm gonna do it." <laughs> you know, yeah. and it's you really have to resist the panic of, "Oh my gosh, no one's saying anything. I'm gonna have to step in and volunteer tell someone to do it." Right. So that was for me a long, a lot of times when I s heard that silence, I would have to, I would feel like, okay, I need to step in and just say, okay, we'll designate you, right? And it really ha took me, it was a realization, like I really just have to wait, even if I have to wait like minutes upon minutes of si sitting through silence, 
eventually it will emerge and the right owner will emerge. And it really is, it's about getting over that, you know, for me at least. What you're saying, Matthias, I've been through that situation in our team, for example, you sit there for five, ten minutes. And nobody <laughs> wants to take ownership. Everybody, too. <laughs> and then uh, the manager just comes down, okay, you're doing it. And then that never gets done because that's always the lowest priority item on the task list <laughs> for, mm -hmm. for that person to actually take care of. He or she has higher priority items that need to be delivered. So, yeah. right. But even then, you can ask, so why are we sitting in silence? What, you know, ask that question. We've sat in silence for five minutes. Why do you think this is, right? Well, or have a quick conversation. Why do we value this thing? Because maybe nobody's taking it because they don't realize how important it is. Well, you can ask questions like sometimes, Sam's, who has done it before? Does, does anybody know about so, how so it can be done? Yeah. Someone will yeah. definitely say, yeah, I did it. So I like the suggestion of... Uh, making it easier for people to kind of self-identify and by asking questions. Um, what I liked about what you just offered of, of perhaps explaining why it's important is uh, speaking into that silence and realizing what, what, what we're missing here is a, is a narrative of why, why, why this is important. That is true. And so maybe a leader could, could without saying, do this, the leader could say, well, the reason something needs to be done is you know a user is encountering this kind of problem and this is how it affects them and this is how it affects their customers when they encounter that problem by providing that narrative that might might help it's striking to me that that might cause whoever is providing that narrative to take several steps back so that where maybe they started with saying who will do the thing all of a sudden they're no longer talking about who's going to do it and they're no longer talking about what's going to be done they're just explaining the, the story, the context in which the problem exists. So to come to that, I'll give you on a day-to-day -day basis, our team faces a technical problem. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows how to fix it. We get blocked by it on a weekly basis. Uh, two or three developers might get blocked out of 17 developers uh, with, the, with that problem. Mm -hmm. Whenever it's discussed in the team meeting, OK, we need to really sit down and fix this. Nobody volunteers. It's been a year now. The problem exists. Nobody wants to volunteer. Manager finally assigns someone that you are going to take care of this problem in, the, in this month's time frame. But we why would a manager yeah. assign what about a scrum master? No, I'm, so we are still in the transitioning phase okay. of uh, being agile. So the thing is, the manager is still leading the team. Um, but the thing is that even if something gets assigned to a person and that person knows the gravity of the problem that the team gets blocked uh, when they have to do the builds and there is a problem, yes, I'll take a look into it. Sure, but it's been over a year. My, <laughs> my sense, and I could be wrong here, but my sense is look at uh, psychological safety. Um, Amy Edmondson, uh, if you go look there, I think people don't want to speak up because there might be retribution or something is weaponized. If you don't do that, there might be some other things that might happen. So make sure the con ground conditions are correct, because once again, these things won't happen if you don't hold the correct space for it. And psychological safety is a really big piece of it. Okay. Recognize the person who solves it, and next time everyone will volunteer. <laughs> yeah, precisely, yeah. Yeah, and what you reward, you will reward right. that. Yeah. yeah, whatever you, you measure or value. But would you, would you expect that behavior from a non-agile team? If the team is not agile, if, it's, if you're not practicing uh, Scrum or any, any other framework, would you ask people to volunteer uh, to resolve issues. <laughs> but Agile, they do. There's the backlog, the team signs up no, on the if, work. If it's non-Agile, I'm talking about... Uh, I've kind of lots of Agile teams. Don't use that. Agile. <laughs> 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 it depends on the team. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't have anything to do with Agile. It, it depends on the team of people you have. So Non-Agile, use the purple side. <laughs> This kind of a behavior from because we're talking about agile, you know, right? This is the agile setting, right? So, would you expect this kind of a behavior, uh, problem-solving behavior, from a non-agile team as well? 
on, you know, on what basis? Because yeah, I'll, I'll probably say, say the Fed because it's top down, it's management. Yeah, they're it, managers. It might be a startup who's got a really visionary leader. They're not agile at all. They don't even a Scrum framework will slow them down. Mm -hmm. Are they agile? No, they're not. They're beyond agile. Do they have a daily stand-up? No, because every time they go get coffee or go to the water cooler, they talk about what they do. Yeah. So because those guys are to the point where they, their feedback loop is in increments of a day, not one daily stand-up. But then you get other people that are still in the, here's the work breakdown structure, here's right. your assignment, you have to do this. Yep, they probably got to work in that, uh, I don't know what color that is. But, yeah, they've got to work on the purple side. And um, they will probably get the, the customers will all leave at some point. My suspicion, I could be wrong, but somebody else is going to eat them for lunch. And it might be a little startup with three people or two people versus a company of millions. I've been at organizations that's 150 years old that are going, the dot coms are eating us for lunch. And it took them five years to realize it. Mm -hmm. And they work like that. Right. It might have worked a hundred years ago. Really cool when Taylor had all those things in place. This is what you need in today's world. You want to survive. And not all systems need to survive. That's what Devin said as well. So it's all about learning organizations and deliberately being deliberately de developmental. If you can't keep growing, you won't keep up. Okay. And with that, I want to say thank you. I had a lot of closing thoughts here already. Um, we always say, so what, now what? Now that you've got these great insights, as uh, one of my favorite Tao saying goes, we chop wood, we carry water, we get enlightened, we chop wood, we carry water. Okay, <laughs> so life will go on. Um, if you want to learn more, We've got this call called, course called Leading in Complexity, which we're going to have here in... Oh, I updated it on my laptop. It's going to be actually in this building. Thank you to Matthias. Uh, June 16 and 17, a two-day class. You can find more information at interagility.com. Just click on events. It's a couple of courses there that uh, Kevin has got in place. And there is a discount code called NOVA, if you're interested not very expensive. The course is not accredited at this point, but it's based on the IC Agile Leadership Track. So at some point we will get it accredited. And find us on LinkedIn if you haven't already. We'd love to stay in touch. And with that, thank you.